Can building nurse resilience truly move the needle in healthcare by improving nurse retention and teamwork? Let's talk all about it with Teresa Walding and Lynn McWright, right here on episode 259 of The Nurse Keith Show. Well, hello and welcome to the Nurse Keith Show. I love having you along for this wild ride. Whether you're new to the show or you've been on this journey with me for months or years, as always, thanks for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. This podcast is all about you and your nursing career, and I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, technology, and beyond. And did you know that Nurse Keith Coaching is your one-stop shop for all things related to your career? That's right. I offer individualized coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals around the world. And if you mention that you're a listener, you'll get 10% off your first coaching package. Email me today at keith at nursekeith.com and we'll schedule a complimentary consult to explore how coaching can help you have the most satisfying life and career possible. Meanwhile, if you want to see the show notes for this episode, hop on over to nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 259. Today, we're welcoming friends of the pod, Teresa Walding and Lynn McWright, true leaders in the fields of holistic health, nurse coaching, nurse retention, and nurse leadership consulting. Teresa and Lynn, let's jump right into it. How do the principles of resilience that you teach improve nurse retention, performance, and outcomes? Well, first of all, we, we work with the leadership in nursing from the CNO and directors, managers, those kinds of folks, because they have the biggest impact on their staff. What, we, what we're bringing to the nursing world is what we're calling principles of resilience. Okay. And that entails us teaching and having a real organic conversation, really, about how do we create resilience in our life? And how does that bleed over into our staff, our patients, our HIPAA scores, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, all of the things that we treasure and and try to do and bring to our patients. But it really starts with the nurse first. We really have to do that, I, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Teresa. And Lynn, if you want to chime in on this, I'll ask a clarifying question. So what is it that you find that corporate that not corporations well healthcare organizations what do they need to know about resilience what is it that is so important about it well what resilience does as a benefit is job satisfaction for the employees which is is also um, retention of employees oh okay that that's absolutely huge. I'll say a little bit more about that in our home state. There was a recent study it came out about three years ago now that was a study by the Texas Work- Workforce Commission of all of the graduates of all of the 215 schools of nursing in hmm. Texas. And their findings were that the average length of stay in the profession of the new graduates was 18 months. 18 months that's shorter than i even thought it was not even making it to their first renewal of their license okay and have you and teresa identified some of the factors that lead to that attrition that really fast attrition from the profession when we're working in a healthcare city setting they're most concerned about employee satisfaction and retention because it's very expensive to replace a nurse. And what we found is that when a nurse can identify with her own resilience, that cuts down on, or eliminates rather, burnout. It eliminates bullying. And they're able to communicate with each other in a collegial manner, in a civil manner, explaining their differences um, rather than fighting over them. And they're able to work together as a team so much more effectively. I see. Now, Teresa, to piggyback on that, so is it a organization or facility's responsibility to help their nurses and staff develop personal resilience? 
I don't think it's like their responsibility per se. I think, but I think it's our responsibility to recognize when our nurses are hurting, when they're not happy with their job or, you know, I don't get in on the end of it where, where people are describing their dissatisfaction or whatever with nursing on the job necess- necessarily, but I see it. So I think it is our responsibility as nurses, as healthcare providers, to check in with each other, to know, hey, you know, you don't seem yourself today. Something's off. Extending that bit of care and compassion to our staffs as well as our patients. So if we don't do that, I don't know what we're doing, you know? Okay. So if it's not an organization's quote unquote responsibility to make sure their nurses are resilient, it sounds like that it is a good idea. It's prudent for an organization to have their finger on the pulse of how their nurses are doing individually. And I wonder how that trickles down from the executive level down to the middle management level and down to like what you were just talking about, the staff nurses being kind to one another, being collegial. So Teresa, what happens in that process where is it everyone walking their talk and demonstrating it for the staff, like the people who are upper level management and executives? How do you make sure an organization understands and operationalizes this kind of kinder culture? I guess I need to back up just a little bit. I think it is a management responsibility. I don't think they're responsible for it of how the nurse um, receives it. But I do think that what, what we actually teach is the resilience of the person participating in the educational aspect of what we do that allows them to see how they're showing up in the world, how their decisions actually do impact their staff or their thoughts about their staff even because it's in your recognition and your understanding of what people are going through but you have to have your own insight of how you create yours first before you can tell someone else how to act or be or do so there's a a learning aspect for us to really become resilient ourselves before we can actually do it for other people or help other people see it for themselves. And when you say learning to be resilient ourselves, you're referring to executives, managers, nurses, all the parties involved in this process, right? Every single person has to see it for themselves Mm -hmm. before they can even begin to see what the changes are or what the changes need to be. If I can look at, my staff, I haven't been in management for a while, but I certainly remember being there. Mm -hmm. But if I can look at my staff and know who's struggling and who's not, but I'm struggling more than they are, how much help can I be for them? Very good point. So Lynn, in your experience working with Teresa and working in these healthcare organizations, what have you found in terms of the receptivity of, say, C-suite executives and managers and middle managers in healthcare, do they push back against this idea or do you find that they really want to do this? They want to walk their talk and create this kind of culture or do you you have to cajole them into this? So what, what is your experience of these folks out there? What are they saying to you? The most important thing that we can do in working with any institution is to work with the top top level person first. So what we do ideally is that Teresa and I will offer a private retreat for that CNO. And during that private retreat, three or four days even, it can be an opportunity to really learn a new understanding of how human beings function through our thought because thought is the most important aspect of how we create our reality. Mm. And are you finding receptivity to this in that management and executive realm? Do people feel like this is important? 
it has to be adopted from the top. So yeah. when, when it's seen by the uppermost level, then yes, it, it goes down from there. We're, there was a large Midwestern medical center that was a pilot project for this. And what was found was that the healthcare providers reduced their repetitive thinking. And when that worrying about the future and ruminating about the past dropped away, they had much more clear thinking and they were able to see the solution to their patients' problems more quickly, get away from work on time, get home to their families and have better work-life balance. And they love the institution that they work for. Wow. Imagine an institution actually supporting and giving empowerment to their staff to actually have a balanced life. So, so it is possible, right? (laughs) Actually, yeah, that particular um, institution had a research department and the burnout rate institution wide decreased by 12%. 12%. That's significant. Even though less than 1% of the staff took the program. Wow. Very interesting. So this demonstrated for you the efficacy of what you were doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, Teresa, you have been an entrepreneur. You're a board certified nurse coach like I am, Mm -hmm. right? NC-BC. That's right. And you're a faculty member here with um, Advancing Holistic Health and Lynn McWright. And you have a BSN from Boise State U, and you've worked in ICU, pediatrics, rehab, you've done all sorts of things. And you've also been a presenter and a, and a speaker. So it sounds like you bring a lot to this, you bring a lot to the table here. And from your perspective, when you're working with these higher level folks, the managers, the C-suite people, What kind of transformations do you see once they kind of get it and the light bulb goes off? Do you have an example of something that's happened where you've been like, whoa, okay, this person definitely is getting it? Yeah, it's 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 interesting because when you first start talking to people, they are kind of like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand this. And then they begin to see, you know, every single thing in our life starts as a thought. Mm -hmm. Change starts as a thought. Mm-hmm. But then there's the the conversation we have in our head, and this, for example, someone who calls you in your office every day to check in to make sure they're doing the right thing. And every time you see that phone number, you're going, oh, it's them again. Oh, no. And so, you know, what, what, what I've seen is people begin to judge that person less. They begin to see their own thought about that person that is maybe a preconceived idea that's only made up by you may not be true of that person. But the bigger picture is what kind of circumstance or pain is that person responding to from their own thought that prompts them to call you every day before they make a decision? Okay. So instead of getting annoyed, you're you're seeing that this person receiving these daily phone calls might move from annoyance to curiosity, right? From annoyance to curiosity to empathy. Oh, we bring in empathy. Okay, that makes sense. To meeting that person's need that to let them off the hook. Maybe they don't need to call you every day because they have a uh, a thought about if I don't check in, I'm going to be in trouble. Versus. I'm empowered to do my job and I will be supported and then I'll let him know what I did. Okay. But the bigger thing is for the, the, that I saw was the person that was receiving the phone calls was no longer annoyed by the person that called became more of a collegial friend kind of relationship of we're both here in, in administrative jobs to do a job and we need to support each other. Mm -hmm. And, as a result, the phone calls dropped off to almost nothing. Wow. So as soon as you recognize that and you change the thinking, 
that changes your behavior. And then the person on the receiving end of your behavior also changes. We're not independent. We are not independent creatures in this world. Yeah, we're interdependent. That's right. And and we, if we're always living in, quote, fear, not necessarily fear of our lives, but in that fear state, sure. that, that is thought. Right. Why would we, why would we have that? So if we bring that to the table, then that's what we create in our organizations and in the dynamics between people. But when we know where our experience is coming from and it's our thought about them, that's all that's happening. Right, right. And, and this other person is having that same experience. So when people understand that it's a separate reality between people, but that we can actually work together and have more compassion for each other, everything is better. Personal life, professional life, all of it. So it sounds like compassion and empathy are huge here. They figure largely in the ways in which we need to navigate our relationships at work. But it starts with you first. That's the key. Yeah. Not very long ago, I interviewed a gentleman named Jamil Zaki. He is a professor out in the Bay Area, and he wrote a book called The War for Kindness. And it's about bringing empathy back in a fractured world. And it sounds like you're speaking his language about how empathy can transform people and relationships. So Lynn, based on this whole idea of resilience and empathy and compassion, and this idea of where you can take that, that increased empathic response at the top and then trickle it down into the rest of the staff. So Teresa just gave us an example of a administrator becoming less annoyed and learning how to feel more empathy and connection with a staff member or a peer. What do you see within the boots on the ground nurses who are right there on the floor working? How does that affect them in their day to day? Well, I'd love to talk about a couple of our nurses. One was um, a nurse practitioner who was working in an outpatient clinic attached to the institution. And she had a 85-year-old woman who had lost four family members in three months. Mm. Just devastated. She couldn't remember to check her blood sugar. She hardly remembered to give her insulin, only with difficulty. And she was just beside herself. So the nurse practitioner was what takes the place of judgment actually is compassion. So compassion is a side effect of dropping judgment. And the nurse dropped her judgment and she opened her heart to this client. And she said, look, you can't be in two places at once. You can't be here now taking care of yourself and living in the past. Mm. And that lady just got fire in her eyes. And she said, do you mean to tell me that I can't take care of myself because I'm thinking about them? I can't bring them back, but I have the rest of my life to live. So three months later, she comes back, more blood sugar checks than she's had in the previous three years, and an A1C that's ideal for her. Wow. So from where we were with Teresa several minutes ago, talking about resilience and compassion and empathy from the top, now you're talking about how when the nurse is impacted by that particular way of being or thinking or feeling, then it trickles down and affects the patients. Oh, this is a tiny example. One of our students was working in the emergency department and they wheeled in a young man, just 25 years old, too morbidly obese to ambulate independently. Mm. And he said, I want to make some changes, but I want to talk to the doctor. So she said, well, the doctor's over there. I can't come right now. Let's have a conversation. And as the conversation came around, she said, you know, let's talk about calories. You are all fueled up and ready to go in any direction you want. He was so inspired. Hmm. 
And of course, he wanted to stay in touch with her. I mean, talk about coaching, but in the emergency department, not possible, you know, the guard at the door, the first name on the name tag and, and just not possible. But that small acknowledgement of this other human being said to him and he he recognized for himself that there are no limits. Hmm. Wow, that's a powerful story. And that is demonstrative of the power of empathy and compassion and how we can transform healthcare in these very small moments, right? Oh, it, it took no time. Yeah. And what about, what about when that gentleman goes home feeling empowered and then he affects his children or his uncle or his parents or his cousin or his best friend who also kind of catch that compassion and empathy virus, right? Like it, it gets transferred over to the next person and the next person and the next person. So we can see here how this work you all are doing in organizations it's, you know, that cliche of you throw a stone in the water and then the ripples keep rippling out. It sounds like that's kind of the process that happens. That's the way it looks to us. We have the opportunity when we opened our school three years ago for online nurse coaching, we actually opened on three continents. Mm -hmm. So we had a student in Japan, a student in Norway, all across the U.S. We have a student in Canada now. I've been talking to a nurse in Italy. So we have no limits as to how far resilience can go. And it's, it's our joy to bring resilience to humanity through nursing. Wow, you just said something interesting and powerful. It's our joy to bring resilience to humanity through nursing. That is beautiful. And on that note, we're going to take a really quick break. And when we come back, I want to dig a little bit more into this work you're doing with organizations. And I want to talk about the nurse coaching and the training and coaching you do around nurses becoming coaches. And then we'll make sure everyone knows how to find you so that they can connect with you and learn more about what you all are doing, this amazing work you're doing. So we'll be right back for the second half of episode 259 of The Nurse Keith Show. So now we're gonna take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash nurse keith and if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me please consider referring them and if they become a paying client you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me and there's no expiration date on that credit so you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most and remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits what an incredible deal and please head over to nursekeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. Remember, nursekeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now, Let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. And we're back. Thanks for hanging out here on the Nurse Keith Show, episode 259. Remember, the show notes and all the links you're going to want to check out are at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 259. Now, we're here with Lynn McWright and Teresa Walding from Advancing Holistic Health. And right before the break, Lynn, we were talking about some examples of patients who have taken on this notion of resilience and empowerment. And basically what I can see from what you're saying have transformed their own lives and probably the lives of people around them. And this has to do with the, the 
empathy and compassion that are being expressed within the healthcare system with whom that patient is interacting. So you are a double board certified nurse in health and wellness nurse coaching, and you're also an advanced holistic nurse, and you have an MPH, and you're an adult and gerontological nurse practitioner, and a clinical specialist in community health nursing. Other than that, you haven't really accomplished much in this lifetime, but you know, I just wanted to give that small plug for <laughs> the few things you've done to advance your expertise. Well... Uh, <laughs> It's really been fun. Yeah, I actually started my own private practice of nursing in 1986, so more than 30 years ago. Wow. And I've had the opportunity to work with the same um, resilience model that we're using today, but I didn't have exactly the the best way to teach it. Um, and that came to us in the fall of 2015 through the work of Dr. Keith Blevins. Teresa can tell you her personal story about that. But we have now, uh, moving forward, a, a framework that actually is very explanatory, very simple, uh, less than 24 pages. It has just um, a couple of diagrams. And it's all of our learning in our program and in our um, coaching with institutions is through insight rather than through intellect. Hmm. Insight rather than through intellect. So you're, are you trying to connect as much with people's right brains as their left brains? Well, in, insight comes um, in its own time from its own place. All of us have experienced insight. Um, stepping out of the shower will say, oh, that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. or, or driving down the road, oh, I get it now. You know, and you laugh about a joke you heard three weeks ago. But that's how we all learn to walk. Now think about it. One foot in front of the other, wobble, 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 fall down a million times, get back up, do it again. We didn't read a book. We didn't watch a video on YouTube, how to walk. Mm -hmm. We saw mom and dad doing it. We tried like the dog. That wasn't very useful. And what this insight is now being recognized as the best way to learn because when we realize through insight through our own internal wisdom what the the truth is for us that is lifelong learning it never disappears mm. Wow, that's wonderful. And, you know, you mentioned that you've been using these principles of resilience and this work you've been doing for about 30 years, and you've had a private practice as a nurse for 30 years. You're, you're up there with Linda Bark and Barbie Dossie and these other nurses who have been out there in the forefront of entrepreneurship for a long, long time before any of us were even talking about it. So kudos to you for having been on that the cutting edge for such a long time and yeah i knew that i was 30 years ahead of my time i just thought you were <laughs> i had to wait for everybody to catch up to me but what i realized in the fall of 2015 was that nurse coaching was the perfect vehicle yep. for resilience exactly and i'm sure you're familiar with linda bark and barbie dossi and all those folks involved in that that community Absolutely. I actually have started a collaborative of all five of the schools of nurse coaching. So we now meet on a quarterly basis to um, have special speakers on topics that we're interested in, in regard to moving this area of expertise forward. That's wonderful. That's great. Now, Teresa, we were just talking about that whole resilience paradigm. And in the first half of the show, we were talking a lot about your your collective work with organizations and how you help help them to create these cultures that are based more on insight and resilience and compassion and empathy. Now, if we switch gears just a tiny bit, you are a board certified nurse coach and you and Lynn both provide that training for uh, burgeoning nurse coaches. So what do you find is happening in this other part of the business that you both are running in terms of working individually with nurses or groups of nurses to become certified. What are those nurses coming to you for? Like, what do you find 
What are they hungry for when they come to you? I think they're hungry for getting back the essence of what nursing is. You know, that we, I know a lot of them talk about, um, you know, losing their, uh, what do you want to say, compassion or desire to do, say, hospital nursing or, you know, bedside care. Mm-hmm. But more than that, they want to know what their next step is. What, where can I take all of this knowledge that I have, all of this desire to help people, and focus it in a direction where I can do this until whenever I want to, mm-hmm. you know? So, and, and they're coming from all different walks of life. We have young nurses who've been a nurse a year. We've even had a couple of people who have not even graduated yet asking if they're eligible to the older nurse who's been retired for years. And so they're coming from all walks of life, but they still have a desire to help people. And I think with everything that nurses learn and have taken care of and helped each other, I don't think there's a limit in sight for no matter what age you are, no matter what you want to do, you can bring that knowledge and continue your journey by helping people through that. It's kind of like that um, Dr. Seuss book for adults called Oh, the Places You'll Go. Yes. It's like there's there's no limit. You can go anywhere you want. You can You can let this road lead you where you want to go. So if they come to you hungry for this stuff, they're hungry for a connection and going deeper. What do you find that your nurses who come to you for coaching, what are they learning about themselves in the process of becoming board certified? What are the, what are the takeaways for them personally, you know, the growth that happens? It's just astronomical. People mm-hmm. are coming with um, their own stuff, you know, their own grief of family loss, their own... Um, desire to know more about how they work what how does their resilience look why are they struggling or why why is burnout such a problem and they want to they want to figure out how to stop it for themselves because they're they want to give more but to do that you have to know where you're coming from first Mm -hmm. and that's what the and i think that's the biggest takeaway people are having is that their thoughts what they're bringing to life through their thinking is actually creating their life, but they've never seen it like that before. I see. We don't often take a look at what we're thinking in here out to other people and then making other people responsible for what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. And yet we all do it. We all see people that do it, but, we don't take responsibility for it. Very good point. Right. And that taking personal responsibility is so important in every aspect of our lives, whether it's parenting, um, taking care of our elderly parents, maybe taking care of our patients, and then how we interact with people in our daily life, whether it's colleagues or the person in the cafe where we go to get our coffee, right? You can apply these principles anywhere. Exactly. And Lynn, for the nurses out there, Let's say there's one nurse out there listening right now, right? And she feels that she's completely stuck, that she works in an organization where she feels like she's just so much cannon fodder, that administration just wants to squeeze every ounce out of her that they can possibly get, and they don't seem to care about this level of attrition from the workforce. What step or steps can that nurse first take to start herself on on a new journey and a new way of looking at her life and her career? I think I'm going to give uh, some overarching numbers that came to us through a study that the National Institutes of Health did of certified nurse coaches. Please. And what they found was that of the nurse coaches that were certified, 70% of them said that they had improved job satisfaction after becoming nurse nurse coaches. Hmm. And why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, 80% said that they had increased interpersonal relationship benefits. 
and 85% of the certified nurse coaches had improved personal health. Wow. Okay. And what's, what's going on there then? What's, what's happening to make that reality for them? Teresa has a wonderful story that she shares about how that changed for her working in, in post-anesthesia recovery. The PACU job that she had done for 20 years changed, except nothing changed except Teresa. Hmm. Teresa, do you want to enlighten us a little bit on that story? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Just to give a little background, I've been in PACU about 20 years, and you know, after a while, things aren't really um, challenging per se. You know, you see a lot of the same thing over and over. But beyond that, I was really, in my my opinion, burned out. Mm -hmm. I was tired. I was having a lot of chronic pain. Um, I was thinking about leaving nursing. And when I found out about the principles of resilience, it was a life-changing moment. And what's happened since then is the the day that Lynn is talking about was a particularly busy day. I had a patient who was a critical patient, um, had her on BiPAP just so she could breathe. If the BiPAP came off, she could not breathe. So it was, it was a very stressful situation and, you know, a lot of unknowns. And I found myself in a place where I was completely focused on her. I was completely focused on what I was doing. I would even venture to say a place of no extra thinking where all I could do was what came next and what came next. And they were coming very fast. You know, you have, you know, three doctors calling orders to you and, um, you know, in the midst of it, you're charting and taking care of a patient and pushing medicine and, you know, the scenario, it's, it's a, a lot of stuff all at once. And about halfway through the day, I had her about five hours. And about halfway through, I realized I wasn't stressed about it. I realized that I had no control over what was going to happen next, but I was okay with that. And I, as I kept, just kept doing what came next and what came next and what came next, suddenly I was in this place of just doing and doing the right thing. I look back and I had no thoughts of making a decision that I regretted. You know, sometimes in a, in a crazy circumstance, you go, oh, I wish I would have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wasn't there, hmm. was not there. And I had this incredible sense of compassion for my patient. You know, I got to see her go to the ICU. And when I got there, she sat up in the bed and she's like, I think I feel a lot better. And I went, all of this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, she thanked me and she said, you know, I don't think I could have done this without you. Hmm. And it was an incredible feeling of just like, wow, there actually exists a place in healthcare that you can be the eye of the storm, calm and composed with nothing else to do but take care of somebody. And it was an incredible experience of, of just seeing my thought at work and knowing exactly what to do next. Hmm. And every day I strive for that feeling again. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that feeling of present moment awareness. Exactly. Right, it's a mindful way of practicing. Now, I'm sure there's plenty of nurses out there and there might be one listening right now who's <laughs> yelling at the her phone or computer right now saying, yes, I want that, I want that. However, my workplace has no set nurse patient ratios. Sometimes I find myself with seven patients at the same time and I don't even get lunch and I'd be lucky if I go to the bathroom once in 12 hours. So Lynn, I'll put this to you. Something needs to change in that calculus because something's gone wrong. And when nurses are so hard pressed that all they can be is like robots doing tasks rather than being in the present moment, like Teresa was just describing. So Lynn, do you think it's possible? And how would we create a culture where nurses can actually have that experience and be so present? We actually have an opportunity now to bring coaching to all specialty areas within healthcare. 
So there, there are no exclusions. Resilience will be seen to be the most important factor in health for all human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we, we start with ourselves first. But I wanted to share just some statistics about what type of issues we see as coaches. Number one is stress and anxiety. Right. So all of our patients have that. I mean, if they're hospitalized, they're, they're not going to be calm, cool as a cucumber. I mean, very rarely. And beyond that, the second highest um, category of nurse coaching clients is actually the chronic illness, the all the cardiometabolic stuff, heart, lung, diabetes. Right. And so those things are not going to go away. But by dealing with the human being, they've changed the terminology now on, on diabetes. It's PWD, people with diabetes. Hmm. Okay. Instead of diabetics. We're changing the, the terminology. That's how we used to say AIDS victims. And now we say people living with HIV or people living with AIDS, right? right it's right. a different, it's a very subtle change. But words, language is, is in, a, in a sense so, so important to the way we shape our thinking. The third category of clients is actually pain. And those clients are, um, as we know, suffering. We have seen patients who have an understanding of their own resilience, even though they still continue to have pain, the suffering has disappeared. Hmm, I see. Okay. So this is, this is, I, it feels like what we're talking about here, if we were going to, if we were going to distill it down, one of the things I'm hearing is mindset. Some people describe it that way. Yes. So mindset, mindfulness, presence, resilience, all of these different terms, compassion, empathy, these seem to be a lot of the pillars of the work that you all do with individuals and organizations. But it's different because we're not seeking those things out as an end in themselves. They're right. coming to us as a byproduct. In reality, um, what Teresa and I, and I share have no tools and techniques. We have, um, in fact, there is nothing to do except to recognize the truth about who we are and how we work as a human being. And that life only works one way, and that is through thought. Mm. Without thought, we wouldn't have a, an experience of life. Right, exactly. And the human mind is a very curious, creative, malleable thing, isn't it? We have not begun to explore the depths there, but one of the first things that we do say is that mind is not brain. A lot of people, even within healthcare, are stumped by that because they always think of the physiological, the anatomical first, and mind is so much more than an organ in a box. Right, right. It's like the difference between, let's say, the Industrial Revolution and, let's say, the Enlightenment, the period of Enlightenment in, in history, in European history, for instance, that it's you can have the mechanistic view of the world and the universe, and then you can have kind of the more humanistic view, right? I mean, that's, I'm, yeah. that's a stretch, but I was just trying to <laughs> bring a metaphor in there. <laughs> I, I think that works. I, I definitely think that, that that works. Yeah. What what the answers are going to be, we don't even know yet. Because when we take all of the limits off, we see, we don't bring answers to institutions and to individuals. We open the individual to their own answer. Mm. That, Change will come from within, mm -hmm. from within that individual nurse, from within that individual institution. We can't know what those changes are going to be, but they will discover those for themselves. Yeah. And I'm sure, Teresa and Lynn, in your work, you probably run into people who are pretty hardcore 
who think this stuff's kind of woo woo and they're like, no, we just need to get our work done, you know, and there's probably people out there whose minds you probably can't change or it's going to take you a lot of work to do it. But then I'm assuming as coaching and all these different strategies and techniques and approaches become more mainstream and people see the value, I, I sense that we're going to, that this change will keep happening, that it's incremental, but there's going to be change. Job satisfaction affects the bottom line. Mm -hmm. If we don't have burnout and turnover, we're going to have a better bottom line. That's true. And we're, we're going to have more satisfaction on the part of the patients and better scores because we have happy staff, we have happy patients. Now, I like the concept of the triple bottom line. Have you all heard of that? Remind us. It's um, people, planet, and profits. So you don't look at your bottom line as strictly financial, that you also have to think about the people involved. And so there's a bottom line there, which means you're happy staff, you have less attrition, et cetera, et cetera. And then planet, of course, is how the work we do affects the planet and has that bigger environmental impact. So I love that concept of the triple bottom line because that's what you're saying basically is they have to look beyond just the money that's coming in. There's a lot more to it than that. And I think that that very unhumanistic view of healthcare is where we've gone really wrong. And God, I remember like the 90s with diagnostic related groupings and all that stuff. Oh my God. I mean, it was just the the lack of the lack of humanity is pretty, pretty palpable. So if people want to find you all, I know they go to advancingholistichealth.com, correct? Right. And our uh, Facebook is advancingholistichealth.com. Mm -hmm. And we'll have links to those. We'll also have links to your bios and links to your LinkedIn profile so people can connect with you. And I encourage listeners to send you a personalized message on LinkedIn to connect and say, hey, I heard you on the Nurse Keith show. I'd love to connect with you all. And right. so people can come to you for working with their organizations on a big, big level, right? working from the top down. Yes. Individual nurses can come to you to actually study for board certification to become board certified nurse coaches and take that exam, correct? Right. And nurse coaching is magnet recognized. So if they're working in a magnet hospital, all of this certification qualifies towards their education that magnet has to satisfy. Isn't that awesome? Wow. So, you know, a and A, A H and A, Magnet, they're all starting to see that this nurse coaching thing is real. It's not some passing fad, that it's actually a real thing that's that's having a huge impact on healthcare. Well, and when we have happy, um, satisfied employees, we're we're gonna see a change in the bottom line. That is gonna be a, apparent very rapidly. I know of a small hospital in West Texas that has literally no turnover mm. here in here in this state where half of the staff leaves um, the profession after 18 months. Wow. Well, that's amazing. And I encourage any listener out there who wants to learn more about this. If you'd like to bring Lynn and Teresa to your organization and bring them to the attention of the people in charge of your hospital or facility, please get in touch with them at advancing holistic health and see if they can come out and maybe move the needle at your organization. And if you're interested in becoming a board certified nurse coach, Advancing Holistic Health also gives you the opportunity to study with the likes of Teresa Walding and Lynn McWright and take that exam through the AHNCC and become a board certified nurse coach. So I can't thank you enough, you all enough for being here and for for doing this really great work on the macro and the micro levels. It's very, very impressive and inspiring. Yes, thanks Keith. Oh, thank you so much, Keith. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to episode 259 of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember the show notes. You're going to want to check them out at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 259 to read all about the organizational work that Lynn and Teresa do at Advancing Holistic Health and to learn about how you can become a board certified nurse coach through their training process. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. And I want you to take 
positive inspired action in the interest of your personal and professional life and satisfaction every day. The Nurse Keith Show is expertly edited and produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our stalwart social media ringmaster. Rob and Mark together keep the wheels moving in a positive direction. So be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith signing off until next time from beautiful and chilly Santa Fe, New Mexico. Teresa Walding is signing off from Colleen, Texas. Colleen, Texas. And Lynn McWright saying adios from Woodway, Texas. Woodway, Texas. Thank you both. Thanks for doing this great work in the world. And it's just been wonderful. 